What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is April 12th of 2021. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video I want to spend some time to talk about what may be one of the most controversial topics in the cryptocurrency space at the moment but also one of the most exciting competitions going on in crypto and that is no other than the competition between BNB or the Binance Smart Chain against ETH or the Ethereum network to compete for the spot of the layer one protocol call for programmable smart contracts, DeFi, enterprise blockchain, etc. So we're going to be diving into the current situation in the sense of market valuations, where things are at right now, but really talk about what matters at the end of the day, the two flaws that both chains are facing right now, and the question of how either one is going to win out over the long run. And the answer is, who's going to be able to fix their flaw first? So we've got lots of things to discuss as we go throughout this video right after our quick sponsor. And our sponsor for today's episode is Taxbit. The 2020 tax season is here. Calculating taxes on cryptocurrency is complex and time consuming, but Taxbit has made it easy by automating the entire process. Link your exchanges and wallets to seamlessly pull your transactions through their tax engine and auto generate your tax forms. Aside from automating taxes, Taxbit provides crypto enthusiasts real-time portfolio tracking and tax optimization visibility so that you can make tax optimization crypto trades throughout the year. If you're looking to stay IRS compliant, have real-time portfolio visibility, and save money on cryptocurrency taxes, then Taxbit is the platform for you. Check out the link down below in the description for more information. Alrighty, everyone. So let's go ahead and dive straight in to the conversation here. Taking a look over the last 24 hours, we can see not only that BNB is up over 18% here, making it a good time to just kind of focus in and take a more rational approach to what's going on. But outside of that as well, we can see here that plays like Uni and a variety of other cryptocurrencies are in the green. Now, the vast majority of the market either neutral or in green territory with very few plays down here in the red. So let's go ahead, spend some time here to talk about this rise in BNB as an asset. You know, just taking a step back here since the beginning of the altcoin cycle in early January, BNB has gone from around, you know, uh, less than 122,000 Satoshis all the way up here towards around 950,000 Satoshis, a major multiple against Bitcoin. And it has climbed and risen all the way up to the third position in regards to market capitalization. As you guys saw earlier in the video here, it's really uh, basically around three multiples away from reaching up towards around Ethereum's market cap, generally speaking. So now that we can just kind of take this into account here, we understand that it's risen past XRP, Cardano, Polkadot. BNB really is the contester here. Binance Coin is the contester so far against Ethereum. It's really not Cardano. It's not Polkadot at the moment in the sense of the market valuation. So everyone's really on edge about BNB with things like PancakeSwap and Venus and all these other DeFi protocols to become the next major contester against Ethereum. And I wanna go ahead and spend some time to take as neutral of an approach as I can towards analyzing this. But we first have to look a, a look at price here and how it differs, right? BNB, which has done this massive multiple and actually today it officially uh, more than 10X tier from its value back here in January. Whereas Ethereum, which is, yes, building into more of a kind of parabolic buildup here over a longer term trajectory here going into 2021 and 2022, it's still setting in higher lows and higher highs. So Ethereum is generally still outpacing Bitcoin here. It's been doing phenomenally since back here in September 2019, but definitely not anywhere near the multiples of BNB, right? BNB was simply a smaller cap cryptocurrency, uh, or I would say pretty much a mid cap back in the day, uh, eventually becoming a large cap and coming into the third spot. And this is all happening, of course, during a period of time where altcoins are set for increase, especially lower cap cryptocurrency. So we, we have to take this in mind here, right guys? The altcoin cycle, which we started back here in January, we had the first wave leading into February. We're in the midst of the second one. We just made previous resistance back from the summer rally into the early part of fall, new support. So now we're going up here towards 48, 49%. Market cap, of course, is going to grow in a lot of these altcoins. But I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about this competition and just, just cut straight to the chase. Right? What are we going through here right now with Ethereum and BNB? And have we experienced something like this before? That I think, you know, that's always a good question to ask, like have we been here before within the cryptocurrency space? And can we learn anything from previous experiences to kind of dive forward into analyzing, you know, what might happen in this case scenario? Well, if we take a look here, 
Let's go ahead and look at one example that many of you will probably remember if you're fans of the Data Dash channel or viewers of the Data Dash channel as far back as 2017. Specifically back in November of 2017, when we almost had the cashing or the Bitcoin cash flippening over Bitcoin and market capitalization. Uh, this is a moment in time and in history in crypto where Bitcoin Cash was one cryptocurrency. Now it's forked off into a variety of other currencies. And we've seen now it's it's almost a dead effort at this point, unfortunately. I love a lot of the intentions of Bitcoin Cash, don't get me wrong, but again, uh, really hasn't scaled like Bitcoin has here over the bull cycle. But outside of this as well, uh, was really looking to contest against Bitcoin in a very, very short window of time. So for example, we can see here, this was back, uh, this time window we're looking at this rack from September 2017 here in November of 2017. We can see that while Bitcoin Cash had really had this silent period here, as Bitcoin was rising up, there was a turn here where Bitcoin Cash not only started to move up equally with Bitcoin, but built a solidified higher base as Bitcoin was moving lower, setting lower highs and lower lows, and started to actually go vertical upwards as Bitcoin was depleting. Now, this was just in the span of really a couple of days here, right? About pretty much a week's worth of price action here from November 5th here to the 11th, right? Just a couple trading days. And again, started to showcase an opportunity where Bitcoin Cash could possibly replace Bitcoin. It could become the actual Bitcoin in the sense of market valuation. And everyone at the time, we were doing a live stream at the time, we had, I think, nearly like two, 3,000 viewers listening in, maybe even more than that. And everyone is on their seats going, oh my God, is, is Bitcoin Cash about to just completely replace Bitcoin? What is this meant to be? Is this just the moment we're realizing it? Well, I want to mention a few things here, guys, some things to be skeptical about. First off, on a technological basis, uh, the reason why I actually use this example to compare it to Binance Smart Chain Ethereum is that outside of the consensus means, uh, technology is not too far off one another, right? Uh, the, the technology, you know, on both chains allow you to do pretty much the same things, right? So when a Bitcoin Cash and uh, Bitcoin, the only kind of uh, different argument you had here, and it is similar to Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, was the security element, right? The amount of decentralization in Bitcoin was much further than that of Bitcoin Cash, right? And this also played out in the sense of the market here, right? Bitcoin Cash was uh, giving us obviously a greater chance of potentially multiplying here in the sense of price. Uh, but along with this, you know, most of the volume here was coming from foreign exchanges that were much less regulated. And outside of this as well, um, you know, again, it was built off this kind of short-term hype. It didn't have over a steady process of fundamental adoption. Uh, the fundamental adoption per market price of Bitcoin Cash was way higher than what you would have gotten in Bitcoin at this point, right? And this is why it was inevitably short-lived, where the vast majority of the games came down. Now it did, in US dollar terms, still continue to increase and set new highs by the end of the cycle, but Bitcoin had far outpaced it at that point, right? So here's the critical thing that I wanna talk about here today, guys, is whether or not Ethereum, at the end of the day, its problem here, and I, I wanna focus first on Ethereum, whether or not Ethereum can fix its issue before Binance can fix its issue. So let's go ahead and talk about these two critical things here. So first off, Ethereum really is where it is today because of a few key protocols. Ethereum first was founded as a way to raise capital and serve as a conduit to raise capital for a variety of different speculative projects, ICOs, initial coin offerings, back in 2017. And after that, it dropped 90% against Bitcoin, which already dropped 80% in price simply due to the fact that Ethereum purely was a bubble at that time. It really didn't have much fundamental development, similar to the dot-com bubble. But during the reaps of the bear market, we had the creation of Uniswap. We had the further development of protocols like Compound that really started to come out and offer real solutions, real actionable applications for Ethereum that made use of decentralization for specifically finance. And Uniswap has been one of those plays here that, again, has been one of my largest plays going back since the beginning of the Saltcoin cycle and did pretty phenomenally well back here in January. And I've still been holding on waiting for a further breakout here. But I got to be honest here, as much as I'm a fan of Uniswap, we have it directly integrated in Digifox. I've used the Uniswap protocol a ton. I love how they did their community distribution. There's so many great things about Uniswap and the broader Ethereum ecosystem and DeFi. As much as it has a leap up against other protocols, it is starting to lose ground significantly. And it has to do with one major limitation. 
It's not settlement time. It's not being able to do enough things on Ethereum. There's tons of things to do. It's that it's way too damn expensive. And sorry to use language, guys, but I gotta be real here. There are a ton of people who have been building in this ecosystem, waiting, and users as well, rightfully so, have been waiting for network fees to get back to where they used to be before uh, really DeFi had taken off, where you could do a transaction on Ethereum for a couple of cents uh, and a swap in this case for pretty much around a dollar. Right? It was very reasonable to be able to make swaps back in the day, even sometimes a couple cents. And we've constantly seen here, and I, I don't mean to rag on any specific teams here, but let's just cut to the chase here. Optimism and its implementation, um, you know, basically on mainnet for Uniswap, actually deploying Uniswap contracts on Optimism and actually being able to reduce those gas fees is what everyone was waiting for with the Uniswap v3 launch or an announcement, right? And unfortunately, you know, even after being told back in March that there was going to be a mainnet deployment for Optimus where people got really excited, we then heard through the launch of Uniswap v3 that as the protocol is now focusing on liquidity optimization, uh, that it's going to be deploying in May with a launch of Optimism. So we were expecting that it was going to be in May. It has now been pushed back all the way here to July. Uh, this report came back out on March 26th. And again, just to really kind of pin, pinhole my point here, I don't know if I'm using the right analogy or, or kind of terminology, to really solidify my point here, I guess, you can see the date when this was published back on March 26th. And I gotta tell you guys, again, as someone who has used Uniswap as our swap protocol, and I've had a ton of users complaining about network fees, it hurts to read this. I understand that there needs to be pushback on developer dates sometimes, but take a look at what BNB did after March 26th. This was the bottom here for BNB after its first initial rally. And look where it's at now. This is the only reason BNB is going up. It's because of Ethereum's long-term flaw, unfortunately, of not focusing and prioritizing layer two ahead of time. And the thing I have to say here is, look, I understand very clearly why Optimism wants to launch right. I, I get it completely. Uh, they do not wanna launch. You have to think about things in kind of a multifaceted approach. Optimism, at the end of the day, wants to make sure that when they launch this, they have all of the community tools synchronized together. They want to have Uniswap. They want to have Compound. They want to have every major pro protocol out there. They want to have wallets like Arjun and Digifox and Dharma. They want to have everyone in the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem to be ready to go day one. So I can go and bounce between other protocols and at the same time benefit from the mass amount of money that you could save through actual implementations as they did on synthetics early on, right? So I get it. I completely get why Optimism's in this camp. What I have to say here is that I think that the DeFi protocols out there in the market, whether it be Uniswap, whether it be Compound, whether it be other decentralized exchanges like SushiSwap, all these players have not put in enough focus in my opinion. And I understand at the end of the day, guys, very clearly, they are working extremely hard. I understand there are things that I don't get to see at the end of the day. But it, it surprises me how there are protocols like DYDX and a variety of other players who have built in layer two solutions, who have made this happen. Loopring has made this happen. A lot of other players out there in the market. And there just hasn't been a sense of urgency to really push this to happen sooner rather than later. Liquidity optimization would be great, but this is who's eating your cake here. It's not LP optimization, it's BNB, right? Compound, uh, you know, and other major protocols like MakerDAO are, are not getting eaten because, you know, Venus uh, or some other, BN, you know, Binance Smart Chain DeFi copycat is going out there and doing something better than them. No, it's because the fees are lower, plain and simple. And to be fair, they're doing a good amount more in community outreach and development. Plain and simple, guys. So this is a big flaw in the Ethereum ecosystem, just thinking that we've got it in the bag. Ethereum's going to be the number one layer one. I think that mindset is what's killing Ethereum. Not focusing on making these protocols more user-friendly. Not making, you know, again, having alternative solutions, even if they're, for example, early deployments of mainnet for some of these solutions or implementations that are simply temporary and could be marked as use at your own risk. Not giving people that opportunity to get out and invest in the assets that they want in prime time, prime trading, uh, you know, months and weeks. And there's only another option out there that's on another chain. It's going to start eating your lunch, plain and simple. Right? And people don't care as much. All these new users here, unfortunately, do not care about extensive 
absolutely security centralization, right? They don't. If they did, they wouldn't use centralized exchanges. And I know a lot of people in the DeFi and Ethereum ecosystem being completely candid, and I'll be honest and say this myself, I've used centralized exchanges, right? And I understand some of the flaws about them, right? That's why I've slowly moved over time towards decentralized exchanges. But again, for the average everyday trader paying $40, $50 network fees, it's just not practical for swaps, sometimes even more than that, right? If you're trying to trade at certain hours. Now, I've been hard on Ethereum first, and you guys know how much I've invested in the Ethereum ecosystem. I mean, I, I don't even want to talk about in regards to the time and money that I've put into supporting DeFi protocols, building my own Ethereum wallet. I don't need to make the case that I love, I love Ethereum, right? I completely flipped on Ethereum as it became the leading protocol for utility in DeFi. But I have to say here that Binance has got two major flaws here. The first major flaw that I want to talk about is going to be the numbers. Because this price action, it doesn't represent the real fundamental adoption of BNB and the potential kind of hedge that it serves to fight up against Ethereum as a protocol. It simply doesn't, right? I'm going to talk about why that is. And second off as well, in regards to this, right, not only uh, in the sense of, um, you know, being able to uh, really meet the fundamental growth in this case, but outside of that as well, a fundamental argument we're going to have to understand in regards to reviewing the metrics for BNB, right? And these, these two parts kind of build off of one another here. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So Binance Chain, just like Ethereum, has uh, basically equivalency to Etherscan or BSC scan, right? Again, literal copy in this case, right? So again, not to, not to be rude or judging in any case, but it is a direct copy in this case, basically. Now, that all being realized, Let's go ahead and actually dive into the metrics here, right? Binance Smart Chain, first off, and, and this is something that I, I just want to make very clear, um, had a very, very odd period of time where there was a massive spike of addresses here. And I have to say, I understand there's been some, um, there's been some explanation of this, of minting of Chi tokens and you know different types of uh, the points that people brought up. Th there's really no explanation for this, I got to say at the end of the day, guys. Um, this kind of artificial growth is something that, again, not only puts a very big stain here, and, and to be fair, right, let's just ignore this for a moment. You know, the actual growth here, right, as we can see here, and I, I have no doubt, again, this is not all completely organic, but, you know, even if a couple million of these addresses, right, maybe even a couple hundred thousand of these addresses are growing uh, compared to the previous growth here, which looks much more organic and realistic, Considering that, you know, unlike Bitcoin, where you're generating a new address every time, every you, every time you do a transaction, in this case, this actually looks pretty good here, right? But I gotta say, even this growth here, guys, to me, shows artificiality here. You're not having hundreds of thousands of users signing up for Binance Chain every single day, right? For example, like yesterday, right? On uh, sorry, not yesterday per se, two days ago, April 10th, 99,000 users. Previous day, 566,000. The anomalies and data here are, are very, very off-putting. And especially when you have these types of things that whether it was Binance or someone else, this is just purely artificial. It's a complete deviation from any standard trend. It wasn't that there was just absolute interest and then it plateaued off, right? So again, I understand there's some explanations here possibly for it, but still the growth numbers here are not factual whatsoever. I'd have a hard pressed time even believing here in February 13th of 2021 that there are 1.4 million unique addresses. Really, I mean, we really have to think realistically about adoption rates here, guys, of DeFi and actually utilizing these chains. Binance Smart Chain average block size. Now this looks a little bit more organic here, right? The block size going from around 4,000, 5,000 kilobytes up here towards 74,000 kilobytes. That looks pretty good. And this again kind of indicates here there's, there's some actual periods of time where things go down, traffic goes down over time. And I'll note that as well, we can see the actual daily transactions. Uh, I don't hope my webcam is getting in the way, but you guys can see this here. Binance Smart Chain again, numbers going up here over time, right? In regards to its actual transaction volume. Like active BEP 20 addresses, right? We can see here a much more realistic number, right? Comparative to the massive spike here, the actual daily active users going from around, you know, 20,000, 40,000, up here towards around 300, 400,000. This is probably the most accurate, and most important chart you wanna look at, real active addresses. It's one thing if I go as a user on Coinbase or an exchange or a blockchain and go buy some crypto once and then sit there 
It's another when I actually have active users generating trading volume, activity on the chain, coming back every single day because there's something good to do, right? This looks much more organic and realistic and actually plays in favorable to the argument that, you know, Binance chain back here in the fall and winter, which really wasn't looking like a competitor, has now actually found grounds. It's found its use case. And it's the fact that it's a much more scalable layer one. Now, here's the thing that I want to talk about at the end of the day. You've got two key factors here, which is some falsification of the data, right? As we've taken a clear look at, the numbers are not as good as they seem, at least to match, you know, a 10x move against Bitcoin here since the same time period. But outside of that as well, what's really important to understand with all of this, guys, is that we can see people paying high fees on the network to Binance Smart Chain, right? Paying, you know, thousands of BNB here, right? Throughout the metrics, we can see that it's happening here. And also, as people argue, uh, there are a ton of, you know, there's a ton of BNB or crypto assets or fees in this case that are being paid to LPs through PancakeSwap. But the thing that people don't consider is that in the sense of fear of people generating false activity, Binance has every ability to do it at little to no cost. On Ethereum, if you want to spam transactions, good luck, you're going to be spending 30, 50, $100 on a swap if you really want to try and go do that, right? To generate fake swap volume, plus you're paying it to LPs that are actual real LPs. But there's a very big chance here that Binance, being a massive exchange with a ton of assets, is probably providing a ton of these resources, liquidity provision for pancake swap. And along with that as well, the actual validation of the network where minor fees are collected. This is the one thing I wanna say. Now, I'm not accusing Binance of anything here. I'm saying though, that being a healthy skeptic here, there is a situation that is possible on Binance Chain that just simply isn't available on Ethereum, right? It's not that it's not possible, but it's much, much less likely on Ethereum because there's a much more broader ecosystem of validators, hence the more decentralization to the Ethereum network versus Binance chain, which has a, few, a select few validated nodes that are actually confirming these transactions. If they're collecting the fees for the network to process transactions and the liquidity provision fees on protocols like PancakeSwap, providing the vast majority of the liquidity, they have every incentive to just basically circulate volume throughout these accounts, right? To make it seem like as if people are using it. Now, I'm not going to denounce that there's real organic volume. There is, there absolutely is. There are a ton of you out there who have been telling me about BNB, um, even though I know out there, again, there's all kinds of, there's tricks to the train stuff. I know there are a lot of people out there who are fans of Binance. And Binance, to be fair, is a very, very heavyweight player in the cryptocurrency space. I have nothing negative to per se say about Binance. All I'm saying here is that I think they're taking upon an opportunity here. And I gotta say, there's a few things that just are screamingly obvious and give it away. Take a look, for example, at like the total value locked up, 7.6 billion here on PancakeSwap. Take a look at Uniswap's, Uniswap's liquidity. Really? I mean, I mean, come on. like really like trying to just kind of trade the fine line here of being right on par with Uniswap. This is the kind of stuff that I don't like guys. Like to me, it, it speaks to a little bit of the artificiality that one has to be concerned about. Again, the same exact case of what we talked about here, where everyone was so convinced in a moment's notice that Bitcoin was gonna be replaced by Bitcoin Cash, right? That Roger Veer was, uh, was absolutely right on the call here. And that, you know, Bitcoin was gonna crumble overnight. Right, everyone started selling their Bitcoin, buying into Bitcoin Cash on the hype, and look what happens. Bitcoin recoups, goes to all-time highs. Bitcoin Cash drops from around the 2,000 range down here to 9,000. So, make of it what you will, guys. Again, I'm not here to spew my opinion here or to tell you what's going to happen. I think there's very clearly two things that either protocol needs to fix. Ethereum needs to move much, much quicker on layer two if it wants to wear that crown that it thinks it already owns of being the major layer one protocol that's going to capture that next wave of users coming down the pipeline because they certainly haven't solidified it yet. Binance Smart Chain is a proof of that. And they showed just how easy it is to disrupt this chain, to find one value proposition that Ethereum doesn't have right now and find something that someone's willing to sacrifice, which is absolute complete decentralization. 
And that's the second point here for Binance. Binance Smart Chain will not last long term if it can't A, actually get the real traffic that it's claiming to get, right? I think, again, there's a lot of, um, again, fluff to the numbers here. And second off as well, it needs to have a better path to decentralization for real long-term adoption, in my opinion. Sure, right now, it might buy them some time for users, just like how, for example, um, you know, right now, maybe there's a bit of time for Ethereum to still remain as layer one and get away with high gas fees. But when this new wave of users come, there needs to be trust that no one's going to be using this. It's the whole point to cryptocurrencies. Uh, again, you know, what we're going to end up having here is maybe a short term run up where BNB does great, but there's going to be some kind of error if the system isn't battle tested. Plain and simple. Right. So again, you know, one thing I do want to say, though, I will say this. At the end of it all, there is one maybe possible silver lining. Could it be that both chains exist? Could it be that BNB almost services as a layer two on top of Ethereum? And I know some people have argued against that. They say that, you know, other layer ones can't be layer twos, right? Like, you know, for the Ethereum network and they're, they're not even comparable here, right? And again, I think that that's, that's quite biased. Like there's XDAI and a variety of other blockchain solutions, uh, layer two solutions that are working right now that have about the same either centralized uh, or relatively centralized components as does BNB and Binance Smart Chain. Could it be that Binance Smart Chain just found its spot as a potential layer two? Who knows? Who knows? We're gonna have to see, but it seems like right now the communities are fractionalized. Most of the BNB uh, Binance Smart Chain users are coming from Binance as a platform and really haven't found their home in Ethereum and vice versa. Ethereum is completely resistant to Binance. Perhaps there's room for collaboration and finding that silver lining. I don't know. Um, but again, I digress on it, guys. If you like this video, please drop a like. Consider leaving a comment down below on your thoughts. Whether you agree or disagree, I want to hear from you guys. This is solely me just trying to be as honest and candid as I can with you all. Because I don't think, uh, the at the end of the day, you do not want to be FOMOing in just because something is you know going up vertically. right? But at the same time, uh, there's nothing wrong with having a bit of hedged exposure to BNB. Right? It's not a matter of going all in, it's a matter of understanding, like, you know, what's your potential, you know, risk here of being all in on ETH and also your all in risk on BNB. Because there's risk in both of those positions, whether other people tell you otherwise, uh, whether they tell you that or not, like there is risk in being exposed to just one asset. So again, for those uh, who are interested, again, uh, to play it safe, there are a lot of ways you can do that. You can simply have a percentage of your portfolio in each asset. If you really do believe that Binance has a chance here, right? That's the simple play. Um, you know, if you wanted to really kind of hedge yourself in, in a level-headed way where you're like, look, I'm long, for example, smart contract platforms, and I don't know if it's going to be ETH or BNB or Cardano, what you can do is you can basically take a look at the market cap here of all these coins. And what you can do is divide each one by the total weighted market cap. So if Ethereum is, let's say, 60, 70% of the total weight of the major smart contract layer ones, then you simply, in this case, if it's 60, 70%, you make it 60, 70% of your portfolio, and then you hedge the rest and on a percentage basis against all those other plays. So that's the key play here. And sorry for the Slack notifications, guys. I'm getting uh, some messages from the, the team at Digifox. I got to get to work. But the point here is that there's a ton of very simple ways where you can hedge yourself if you actually do feel that those are potential competitors to Ethereum. That's the simple answer, guys. So if you all enjoyed this video, like I said, please consider dropping a like, leaving a comment down below, and I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.